The Battle of Castellator was a World War II battle fought between a swarm of SS officers and a motley crew of American tank operators, revolting Germans, and French politicians armed with medieval weaponry. The castle in question was a 13th century fortress turned 20th century hotel turned 1940 militaristic Nazi prison. It was specifically used to house high-value hostages, such as, for example, a group of elderly French people. The prison was surprisingly accommodating, with decent food, a service staff, and free reign of the place so long as you didn't try and escape. But things were quickly kicked into second gear when the war reached its final few months and the Allied forces went to work liberating a nearby concentration camp. Upon hearing this troubling news, the Nazis of Castellator took a bit of a gamble by using the bold military strategy of committing mass suicide or running away. This left the castle solely in the capable hands of its once prisoners, but they were still unable to leave since they were surrounded by hostile Germans that seemed much less keen on killing themselves. Instead, they sent the prison's handyman, a Yugoslovakian guy called Zonimir Kukovic, to brave the harsh conditions and get help from the invading Americans. In the end, Zonimir was successful when he found Major John T. Kramer in a little town called Innsbruck, but unfortunately, Castle Itter was technically outside of America's military jurisdiction. But never once has that ever stopped an American from doing what they wanted, and it certainly wasn't going to now, so good old Kramer sent a small rescue crew with little more than a second thought. So yeah, the mission was successful, but Kramer's men ended up getting delayed by an afternoon shower of Rochling shells, and since instant messaging wouldn't be invented for another 52 years, the boys back home had no idea what was going on, and sent Cook Crowbot to do basically the same exact thing Zonomir just did. Luckily, the cook didn't have to go nearly as far as Zonomir, since all the towns that had been held under Nazi rule just a few days ago were now in the process of being liberated, and it wasn't long before he found Major Sepp Gangle, a defecting Nazi with the single best name I've ever heard, and leader to a small group of other defecting Nazis that probably had much lamer names. Regardless, they agreed to help the castle squad out from their precarious predicament, but since the surrounding wilderness is apparently just bursting at the seams with fun and colorful characters, they quickly bumped into Captain Jack C. Lee Jr. Jack was an American tank operator. With a name like that, I think he may be legally obligated to be an American war hero, so he happily snuck a lot of them back to Castle Litter. Once home, Jack C. Jr. called for reinforcements and prepared for an SS siege, but luckily for them, the first SS officer they came across was a friendly fellow called Captain Kurt Siegfried Schrader, who, just like every other Nazi in this forest, was in the process of ditching the Nazi bandwagon. Also, I'm sorry, Sepp, but this guy might have you beat for my single best name ever award. Anyway, they did eventually find what must have been the only Nazis left at this point on the morning of May 5th, 1945, when the SS stormed their castle. So just in case you need to be caught up, by this point it was the Baffin SS up against an American tank operator, a group of revolting Nazis, a half dozen elderly Frenchmen armed with nothing more than leftover handguns and antique swords, and an Austrian teenager that just pulled up in a pickup truck halfway through the battle. And not only did the SS lose, they lost like really bad. Every single one of them was either killed or taken prisoner, and the only casualties on the other side were Sepp Gengel and Jack Jr.'s tank. By the way, the tank's name was Basat and Jenny, which I just thought was kind of cool. In all fairness, the day was at least partly saved when Kramer's rescue party finally showed up and accelerated the battle's conclusion. But at the same time, it doesn't really sound like the castle squad needed the help, even if it was appreciated. And yeah, I was pretty sad when I heard that Sepp didn't make it, but as a slight silver lining, he was buried on Allied land and has a street named after him which lives on to this day. Plus there's the fact that he's mostly remembered as a freedom fighter, despite the fact that he was probably a regular goose-stepping Nazi for most of his adult life. Anyway, that's basically all I have for you guys today, and I'm sorry if it was a little incoherent, but this entire story is basically just a series of increasingly absurd character introductions. But before we go, I would like to announce this week's winners of the Forge Finding Contest. If you have no idea what I'm talking about, then let me explain. I've been hiding flourishes in the illustrations of my past few videos, and those who find them get mentioned in the next video. I tried hiding them a little better last time. While I certainly kept 404 error from bagging two wins in a row, Davis DeCarper and Mackay Norwood were not so easily deterred. But some honorable mentions definitely have to go to my friend Brooke, who found one on accident, Ski from my Discord server, who wrote some beautiful poetry about the hiding flourish fish, and Gemini S, who is now the legal guardian of all flourishes. Praise be their name. Regardless, keep your eyes peeled, and if you see any in this video, then let me know in the comments down below or on my Discord server. Link in the description. But until next time, don't die. See you later. Mm-hmm. <laughs>